Let's now discuss about sulfonyl ureas. Okay, so from the name, um, one thing is apparent that there is urea. Okay, so let's see if we, it makes sense if we look at the structure. And so urea, what's the structure of urea? Okay, so this is the structure of urea. So it's a sulfonyl urea. Okay, so let's draw what's, let's draw a sulfonyl group. That's a paryl sulfonyl group, and that sulfonyl urea. So a ryl sulfonyl group attached to a urea group. So that would be okay. So if we split the structure. Then we see that it has got three parts here. Uh, so the first part, uh, as we mentioned, is the aryl, aryl sulfonyl group. And this is urea. And that is an aliphatic chain, okay? R could be an aliphatic chain. Okay, so it's got this three distinct parts to the structure. A, B, and C. So this is basically, um, the general formula of a sulfonyl urea. So there are different types of sulfonyl ureas that differ in this group and that group. Okay, but basically, they need um, structure A and structure B to be called a sulfonyl urea. Okay, so these sulfonyl ureas, they have uh, um, Typical adverse effect. Okay. So the adverse effect, the main adverse effect of this sulfonylurea class of drugs is hypoglycemia. Okay. So um, there is a reduction in the blood um, glucose level. But uh, so what's the problem with uh, hypoglycemia? So the problem is um, the brain needs sugar to function. And if uh, the brain doesn't get glucose, then um, it uh, becomes depressed. And this may lead to coma. person will be unresponsive to stimulus or it may have a, a cardiovascular presentation so it may lead to, lead to arrhythmia arrhythmias it may lead to Cardiac issue. Okay, so it's got a CNS presentation, a CNS effect, and a CVS effect. Okay, 
So this uh, basically leads to increased mortality. This is associated with increased mortality and increased morbidity. Okay, so that's the main um, adverse effect of this class of drugs. Is this the only adverse effect? No, there are um, other adverse effects. Now, if you think about it, this structure contains sulfur. Okay, so there is a sulfur moiety here. So, if there is any drug, which is, this is uh, something general that we need to remember, that if there is sulfur in the um, structure, then that sulfur is responsible for, becomes responsible for hypersensitivity reactions, especially those, those related to the um, skin. Okay, so it may cause, so the other adverse effect due to the sulfur in the structure is uh, allergic reactions. Okay, and uh, these allergic reactions are mostly arctic area or erythema. So that's um, another typical um, adverse effect. So what's the general thing that we need to remember? We need to remember that sulfur, uh, if present in the structure, uh, always uh, more often than not causes allergic reactions. In this case, it manifests as urticaria and arrhythmia. So what are the other adverse effects? So we said that uh, hypoglycemia leads to um, um, uh, leading to CNS manifestations and cardiovascular manifestations. Let's look some other allergic uh, adverse reactions. Okay, it may cause uh, GI presentation. It may cause nausea. This is basically a CNS presentation, okay? Um, um, yeah. And uh, this nausea can also be caused due to uh, GI effects, okay? In which case it's associated with vomiting. Okay, so it's got a GI presentation, it's got a CNS presentation, um, and it causes a specific reaction, which is called, let's write it down out here, it's called uh, disulfiram reaction. Okay. So to understand um, disulfiram reaction, we need to diagnose a bit and uh, learn about the metabolism of alcohol. So the alcohol that is consumed is called ethanol or ethyl alcohol and uh, uh, on re it will get absorbed and after that it reaches the liver where an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Okay, acts on it and it requires NAD which gets converted to NADH plus. Okay, and that forms acetaldehyde. Okay, this acetaldehyde Similarly, is acted upon by another enzyme 
and uh, it is acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay, and acetaldehyde becomes acetate or acetic acid. Acetate. Okay, this acetate um, in the presence of uh, acetyl CoA synthase is converted to acetyl CoA. Okay. So this is the normal metabolism of alcohol. So there was a thinking that um, it was uh, known that um, acetaldehyde, if it accumulates in the blood, it causes certain uh, symptoms in the patient. And the symptoms are, it causes uh, flushing, it causes weakness, causes nausea, causes tachycardia. What is tachycardia? Yes, increase in the heart rate. And it causes uh, hypotension. Okay. So these are not very pleasant. Okay, They are not pleasant. Uh, but they are not uh, life-threatening per se, okay, but it's not pleasant to the people experiencing it. So the idea is, idea was, um, ethanol is a drug of abuse, okay, people abuse it, they become addict, addict addicted to ethanol. So the thinking was, um, can we give a drug which increases acetaldehyde in the body? Okay, so the logic is, if there is a drug that can increase acetaldehyde in the body, then it will cause uh, flushing, weakness, nausea, tachycardia, and hypotension, which is not pleasant to the person. So, uh, so could that be used as a method to uh, wean the people away from ethanol? Was the question. And the answer was in the development of a drug called Fompizol. Okay. Okay. So this drug inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay. It inhibits acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. So what will happen if this drug is given uh, on a daily basis to the patient, let's say, let's write it down here, in a dose of uh, 250 milligram OD, okay, once daily, is given to the person who is consuming alcohol, and every time he consumes alcohol, he has these symptoms, okay. So when he has this, he or she has these symptoms, then uh, that happens every time they consume ethanol. So it has got a negative reinforcing effect and uh, the people will be weaned away from ethanol. So that's the idea. So this drug is called an antabuse, okay? And abuse. Okay, meaning it is given, it comes from anti-abuse, anti-abuse, okay? It's a contraction of this word, which is what uh, anti-abuse is. And so the drug that's given as an anti-abuse is Fompizol, okay? But, um, yeah, so it causes an inhibition of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Now, this same reaction the inhibition of acetyl dehydrogenase is shown by our drug, sulfonylureas. Okay, so sulfonylureas 
have got similar effects. Okay, so this acetyl dehydrogenase is again blocked by sulfonyl ureas. Okay, so disulfiram reaction. Um, so the initial drug that was used against acetyl dehydrogenase was disulfiram. Okay. Okay, so the initial drug that was uh, used for as an anti-abuse was disulfiram, and now there is this drug from Pyzol as well. So um, sulfonyl ureas mimic the action of disulfiram. What do they do? They inhibit acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, and so sulfonyl ureas manifest the disulfiram reaction. Okay, so that's another adverse effect of uh, sulfonyl ureas. So what are the uh, adverse effects that we have covered? Sulfonyl ureas first and foremost causes hypoglycemia and because of the presence of sulfur it causes allergic reactions manifested as urticarian arrhythmia and it has got GI as well as CNS manifestations. In GI, we've got nausea, vomiting. Okay, and uh, CNS is nausea, dizziness, headache um, uh, due to this drug. And um, it inhibits acetaldehyde dehydrogenase and therefore uh, it causes the disulfiram reaction. Okay. Occasionally, in addition to this, let's write it here. Occasionally, it also causes uh, hematological manifestations. Okay. Hematological. Okay. And uh, the examples are it may cause um, leukopenia. Um, it may cause uh, thrombocytopenia. It may cause uh, cholestatic uh, jaundice. Okay, so these are the hematological manifestations. Okay, and uh, this is a manifestation um, where it blocks the um, common bile duct and it causes jaundice okay so this is the manifestation in the liver or hepatic manifestation okay or it may cause dermatological effect which uh, okay we have already talked about the dermatological reaction what's the dermatological reaction on the skin it can cause urticaria Okay, so that is the dermatological manifestation it can cause urticaria. Okay, so this gives us the, uh, this uh, should give us an understanding about the main adverse effects of sulfonyl ureas. Okay, and um, the main one, the hypoglycemia is not shown by which drug? By guanides. Okay, so yeah, so that's the advantage of biguinides over sulfonyl ureas. Okay, right. So, um, when we talked about insulin, we uh, mentioned that uh, uh, in the body, in the physiological conditions, there are two types of insulin, insulin release. Okay. at uh, 24 hour, uh, this is uh, uh, insulin concentration, this is time, 
And this is uh, breakfast. And then here you have breakfast. You have lunch. And you have dinner. Okay. So usually, whenever food is uh, taken in, there is a massive release of insulin from the body under normal physiological conditions. Okay, so this is under normal physiological concentrations. Uh, normal physiological, okay. Normal physiological condition. Okay, so the insulin release and during meals, this is called prandial. These are all prandial. Okay. Prandial blood, blood uh, insulin release. Then there is this uh, basal level. Okay. So it is this level. So this is called basal insulin level. Okay, so under physiological conditions, there is a prandial release and there is a basal release. So sulfonylureas increase both prandial and basal insulin concentration. Okay. So that's the important thing we need to remember before we go into the mechanism of action. So let's write it down somewhere out here. We say that sulfonylureas increase both basal and prandial insulin levels. So, sulfonylureas increase both basal and uh, prandial glucose levels. Okay. Um, um, so, let's uh, look at the mechanism of action. Mechanism of action, abbreviated MOI. So from this, what do we realize from this graph that um, sulfonylureas increase both basal and prandial insulin levels, which means sulfonylureas release insulin from which cells secrete insulin from the beta cells of pancreas. Okay, they release insulin from beta cells of pancreas. They make the pancreatic cells secrete insulin. Therefore, sulfonylureas are called secretagogues. Okay, so anything that increases secretion, we call it a secretagogue. So what secretagogue? Insulin secretagogue. So they cause uh, secretion of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. Okay. Um, so how do they do that? That's what we're going to discuss now. So. Um, Sulfonylureas okay, they bind to a particular uh, area um, of the potassium channel uh, called uh, the sulfonylurea receptor. Okay, so S U R one. Okay, and what is SUR1? Sulfonyl urea 
receptor 1. Okay, so that is SUR1. So it binds to SUR1. And uh, what does it do? Uh, bind to SUR1. Where is SUR1 located? SUR1 is located on the ATP dependent. SIR1 is a site on the ATP dependent potassium channel. Uh, SIR1 located on ATP dependent potassium channel. Okay. So, uh, what does it do? This binding uh, blocks the receptor. Okay, so binding of sulfonylurea to SIR1 site on ATP dependent potassium channel blocks the channel. Blocks the channel. So this blockade, what does it do? This blockade. depolarizes the pancreatic beta cell. Okay, depolarizes the pancreatic beta cell. Now, depolarization of the cell, pancreatic cell, results in opening of voltage-gated Okay, so there is calcium entry into the cell. And what does that do? It leads to exocytosis of vesicles containing insulin. Okay. Okay. It does one other thing. Okay. So this is uh, one mechanism. The second thing it does is this drug um, increases beta cell sensitivity to glucose. Okay, so it increases beta cell sensitivity to glucose. As a result, um, it releases more of, um, uh, so what happens if it increases sensitivity to glucose? What does that mean? What it means is, Because of the action of sulfonylurea, what will happen is glucose transporters. Okay, but this is um, um, insulin independent uh, glucose transporter. Okay, and that is called GLUT2. And where is it located? On the beta cells of the pancreas. Okay, in this case, there is only one cell, so we'll write. Beta cell of the pancreas. Okay, so what's going to happen? Lots of uh, glucose will come inside the cell, and what will happen? It will be metabolized to ATP, and this ATP um, basically uh, would block the potassium channel, okay, because it's an ATP dependent potassium channel, okay, and that um, will cause increased release of, that is, this ATP will cause blockade, okay, if that's the potassium channel, and it will cause a blockade of the potassium channel, ATP dependent 
potassium channel. Okay, so that is blocked. As a result, uh, it will depolarize the cell and what's going to happen? All the vesicles containing insulin will fuse with the membrane of the beta cells and then there will be exocytosis. Okay, so this is what um, mm, uh, the glue, this is the effect of glucose on the beta cell of pancreas. Now, in uh, our case, what is happening is there is uh, less sensitivity of the beta cell to insulin, okay, because this is a diabetic patient. So what does this drug do? It directly goes and blocks the ATP dependent potassium channel. Okay, so and subsequently it also increases sensitivity to glucose. So initially uh, in diabetic patients there is decreased sensitivity to glucose. Okay, so in diabetes mellitus there is decreased sensitivity of the beta cell to glucose. Okay, And we have talked about the physiology. So normally in absence of pathology, glucose will directly enter into the cell, become ATP and that ATP will block the potassium channel and that blockade will result in entry of calcium. Okay, and that calcium will cause exocytosis of the insulin containing uh, vesicles and uh, that exocytosed insulin will cause the effects of insulin. But in a diabetic patient, this channel is not very sensitive to glucose and therefore directly the potassium channel is blocked uh, by sulfonylureas which act on a particular area of the ATP dependent potassium channel which we call uh, SIR. All right? Okay, SIR1. So these are the two important mechanisms of actions of um, insulin. So what's important to remember here is that uh, insulin has got absolutely no effect. Okay. Insulin has got no effect on insulin biosynthesis. Okay, it has got absolutely no role in how insulin is uh, synthesized within the cell. But what it does is, whatever stored insulin is there, that is uh, released. Okay. So for sulfonylureas to work, therefore, for sulfonylureas to work, it needs functioning beta cells. Okay, so usually greater than 30 percent okay, of uh, beta cells should be viable only then this drug has got some effect. But what if there is no uh, beta, res, uh, beta uh, cells, beta 2 cells, then it, may not, it cannot work. Okay, it requires functioning beta cells. So that is why in uh, type 1 diabetes, in type 1 diabetes mellitus, the uh, functioning beta cells would become drastically less, okay. So let's say less than 30 percent, okay. So in which case, this uh, sulfonylureas will not be clinically effective. Okay, so that is the reason why sulfonylureas are not given for type 1 diabetes mellitus because they've got less number of viable beta cells. Okay, so that's uh, useful for us to remember.
Okay. So therefore, what is the best way to institute the therapy? So it would be uh, worthwhile to remember that uh, uh, the biosynthetic pathway of insulin. So we've got uh, pro-insulin, which is present within the vesicle. Uh, this pro-insulin gets uh, converted to insulin. Okay. Within the within the vesicle, okay. within the insulin-containing vesicle is where pro-insulin gets converted to insulin. So now, what we understand from pro-insulin is what is pro-insulin then? If this is uh, uh, A chain of insulin and this is the B chain and these chains are held together by disulfide bonds. Okay. Then there is a connecting chain uh, between the A chain and the B chain that is called C peptide. Okay. And this C peptide is, so uh, the A and B chain along with C peptide, this whole Combination is called pro-insulin. We said pro-insulin is converted to insulin within the vesicle. So in the vesicle, what happens? The pro-insulin, from the pro-insulin, this C-peptide minus C-peptide. So the C-peptide is removed and that uh, totally gives insulin. So each vesicle so each vesicle would contain insulin, it would contain C-peptide okay, and various other uh, cellular components, okay, but uh, cellular uh, uh, metabolites, okay. Uh, but what is important to remember here is from each each insulin molecule, a C peptide is present. Okay, so on exocytosis, so when exocytosis takes place, what is exocytosed? Insulin and also C peptide. So for each insulin molecule, a C-peptide is also uh, secreted. So this insulin has got a very short T half in the body. Okay. It's got a very short T half. The endogenous insulin has got a very low T half. Therefore, but C-peptide has got a greater T half. So C-peptide is an indirect measure of the uh, insulin synthesizing capacity of beta cells. So we said that sulfonyl ureas require a functioning beta cells, functioning beta cells in a quantum greater than 30% to be effective. Uh, so the best way to institute therapy is to make sure that there are insulin secreting cells already present in the patient. Okay. So how will we know whether there is insulin producing cells in, uh, insulin producing beta cells in the patient? We can assess that by looking at the concentration of C-peptide. Okay, so that is the relevance of C-peptide. Okay, so C-peptide is an indirect measure of 
the insulin synthesizing capacity of beta 2 cells. So the normal C peptide level, let's write it down here, the normal C peptide level is 0.522 nanogram per ml. So Ng is nanogram, okay, nanogram per ml. So if the concentration of uh, normal C peptide is uh, less than or significantly less than 0.5 nanogram per ml, then uh, that patient might not be a good candidate for the um, institution of sulfonylureas as a drug. Okay. So, ideally, the C peptide level should be assessed before instituting treatment with sulfonylureas. Okay. So, it's important to uh, remember this as well. Okay. Okay. So, we mentioned that uh, sulfonylureas causes, what's the main adverse effect of sulfonylureas? Yes, it causes hypoglycemia. Okay. So, the question is, can we diagnose uh, mm, hypoglycemia um, in the lab? Yes, we can. If suppose the patient is uh, having a hypoglycemic attack and uh, um, it has been managed, but uh, before managing, if some bit of blood is removed from the patient and uh, subjected to analysis, what is usually seen is insulin is seen at uh, a concentration greater than 3.9 uh, micro international unit. Okay, so international, what is IU? International unit, okay. Okay, so that is how uh, insulin is quantified and insulin can be seen um, at this concentration. So we are talking about hypoglycemia induced by an overdose of overdose of uh, sulfonylurea. The blood picture, okay, the blood uh, uh, blood analysis would show insulin to be greater than this and the C peptide would be greater than 1.4 nanogram per ml and uh, glucose, so we are talking about hypoglycemia, so glucose should be really less. So glucose would be 40 milligram per deciliter. Okay, so um, this picture is consistent with sulfonylurea induced hypoglycemia. Okay, so that would be the blood picture. So glucose will be considerably reduced and C peptide would be increased and insulin will be increased. Okay. And uh, this uh, reduction, the hypoglycemia would persist for uh, sometimes one to two days. Okay. So it's a prolonged hypoglycemia, okay. so which is what uh, the adverse effect of sulfonylureas are. Okay. It's a prolonged hypoglycemia, okay, one to two days. Um, okay, so we talked about uh, the adverse reactions. There is one more adverse reactions that uh, would be useful if we can list it around here. Okay, so the other adverse uh, effect is 
In fact, they must write it uh, somewhere there. Okay. So another adverse effect would be um, there is evidence that uh, sulfonylureas Ureas uh, cause uh, teratogenicity. So what is teratogenicity? These are basically uh, abnormalities in the developing fetus. Okay. So what are the abnormalities that are seen? Uh, there is uh, microtia. Um, there is deafness, there can be facial deformities, there can be ventricular um, septal defect, or there can be atrial septic defect. or there can be single umbilical artery. Okay, so there is evidence that sulfonylurea given to pregnant women um, um, can cause these uh, abnormalities in the fetus which is basically teratogenicity, okay? okay. Um, if it is administered to uh, pregnant women, women in the first week of pregnancy. Okay, so if the pregnant women is administered uh, sulfonylureas, in the first week of pregnancy, then uh, there have been case reports of teratogenicity. Okay? Uh, because uh, if you think about it, uh, you are administering it at the first week and all these things are organ defects. So organogenesis happens in the second week, okay, two to eight weeks. We will have organogenesis. So that is why organ uh, um, that is interference with normal organogenesis, okay? So two to eight weeks, uh, these manifestations would be um, seen, okay? So what happens if it's quite early in pregnancy, say maybe first or second or third day, what happens to the fetus if it undergoes some insult? All right, yeah, so there will be a spontaneous abortion, okay? So, um, um, yeah, okay, so there will be interference with organogenesis. Organogenesis happens two to eight weeks, okay. There is organogenesis and uh, prior to one week, okay, if there is an insult, okay, meaning some chemicals is given, uh, before the first week of pregnancy, then there can be abortion. Okay, if the exposure uh, happens um, after eight weeks, then what can happen? There can be developmental abnormal or functional um, uh, abnormalities are seen, but that is uh, what uh, happens in teratogenicity, okay? But in this case, in sulfonylureas, it is uh, administration at the first week of pregnancy when teratogenicity that we have listed can happen. Okay. So what's the solution then? This is a problem. How can we solve the problem? Very good. Don't administer it to, to pregnant uh, patients. Okay, who are our clients, okay? Uh, so, we should not administer sulfonylureas to pregnant women. 
so then what else can you give if you so definitely pregnancy there is what there is gestational diabetes mellitus okay so there is gestational diabetes mellitus is seen in pregnant women okay but to reduce their blood sugar we cannot give sulfonylurea so what can we give right so what can be given what can be administered is insulin so insulin is the drug of choice for um, gestational diabetes mellitus so as far as possible uh, oral drugs should not be um, administered okay yeah okay so now let's talk about the uh, pharmacokinetics of uh, sulfonylureas okay so let's look at uh, pharmacokinetics okay and we are going to look at absorption Okay, so it is administered per oral. Again, okay, on administration orally, it is well absorbed. Okay, uh, food can decrease absorption. hypoglycemia itself can decrease absorption okay hypoglycemia if the patient is hypoglycemic when you administer the drug that itself can interfere with the absorption okay uh, right absorption distribution Okay, so the general thing to remember, let's write it somewhere out here. Okay, so the um, general thing to remember is that uh, sulfonylureas. Let's zoom it up here. Okay, so sulfonylureas are uh, metabolized, metabolized uh, in the liver. Okay, and sometimes uh, the metabolite can be both active or inactive. Okay, and these active or inactive components are excreted in the urine. Okay, so because it is metabolized in the liver, uh, patients who are having hepatitis or any um, hepatic insult uh, in them, the um, the dose needs to be adjusted, or they might be contraindicated. Okay, so in liver failure and uh, kidney failure, we have to pay special attention. Okay, so um, assess what function, liver function. And kidney function. So ideally, before administering uh, sulfonylurea drugs, the liver function and kidney function should be assessed. Okay, because uh, we need to know. Okay, if so, if there is liver problem or there is a kidney problem, then it can interfere with the entire metabolic processes. That sulfonylureas undergo. Okay, so let's come back to what we were writing about the pharmacokinetics. So the other important thing to remember about distribution is that these drugs are 99.9 percent .9 bound to plasma proteins. Okay, specifically which protein? Albumin. Okay. Okay. So, drugs which bind at the same site on the plasma proteins can cause uh, 
uh, a displacement type of drug interaction. Okay, so therefore, because of this reason, there can be displacement drug interactions. So if it is concurrently given with, say, a highly protein-bound drug like warfarin, then there can be potential drug interactions. Okay, and uh, T half is short, around three to five hours. Three to five hours. Okay, so theoretically by five hours, uh, it should uh, um, begin to lose its effect. But uh, hypoglycemic effects effects are seen up to 12 to 24 hours. Uh, that is the reason why uh, these drugs are administered. So sulfonylureas are administered once a day. Okay. Uh, because of this reason. Though they have a short half-life, the hypoglycemic effects persist for 12 to 24 hours. Therefore, they are given OD. Okay, and they are susceptible to displacement type of uh, drug uh, interactions. Metabolism. Okay, metabolism, we have already mentioned that uh, liver metabolizes it to both active and inactive components. Active components. Okay, so metabolism is through the liver. And uh, what about excretion? We said the metabolites are excreted through the uh, kidney. Okay, so there is one more thing to remember here that in distribution 99% is bound to plasma protein and uh, the, uh, pro the plasma protein is greatest for, I'll write it down here, plasma protein binding is greatest for glyburide. Glyburide is a drug, uh, sulfonylurea, uh, second generation that is um, having the greatest plasma protein binding property. Okay. Um, all right. So, what did we study up to now? We talked about the uh, atme of the drug. Okay, so A is absorption, D is distribution, M is metabolism, and E is elimination. Okay, so these are the most important pharmacokinetic characteristics of sulfonylurea drugs. Okay. So now let's look at um, uh, what are the drugs? Okay, so for that, we, these drugs are classified. So let's talk about classification. So we'll talk about classification. Classification of sulfonyl, sulfonylureas. Okay, so it is classified into two generations. Okay, 
it is classified into two generations. So the classification scheme, so let's write it down here, classification scheme okay, is largely based on differences in potency. Um, uh, potential for side effects um, and uh, binding property. So binding to what? We mean plasma protein. Okay, so based on these considerations, sulfonylureas are classified as first generation, first generation, and uh, second generation drugs. Okay, so now let's look at what are the examples of uh, first generation and second generation drugs. All right? So the first generation drugs which came into the market early, um, these drugs, the examples were, okay, the first generation drugs examples are tall butamide. Chlorpropamide, acetohexamide, and tolazamide. Okay, so these are the first generation drugs. The second generation drugs are. Glyburide, um, glipizide, and glipizide. Okay, glipizide. Okay, so these are. Uh, second generation agents. Okay. And gliburide is also known as glavenclamide. Right? So that's just uh, for you to remember. Okay, so there are first generation and uh, second generation drugs. Now, um, the second generation, so we said the classification is based on differences in potency. The second generation drugs are almost 400 times as potent as first generation drugs, okay? But we said it is also based on the uh, potential for side effects. So first generation drugs have more side effects, increased side effects compared to um, um, second generation drugs, okay? But um, that's not necessarily true because long acting drugs will have uh, uh, potential for um, uh, hypoglycemia, but um, yeah. Um, and almost all these drugs are highly protein bound. Okay, so um, the binding property is almost similar, so that's nothing much to write home about. Okay, so yeah. No. So the important thing to remember here is the second generation agents are most potent. Okay. All right. And uh, we are talking about uh, now these drugs are insulin uh, secretagogues. Okay. We need to remember the 
glyburide it's also known as glibenflamide okay um, the first generation agents it's not uh, it's rarely used okay nowadays the drugs that are more commonly used are the second generation drugs okay um and we are going to look at the duration of action so the thing to remember here is uh shorter the duration so this is again um uh, let's write a note and say shorter acting drugs have got reduced side effect okay so they tend to produce less of hypo uh, hypoglycemia which means longer acting drugs there is increased uh, chances for side effects okay so longer acting drugs there will be increased side effects and which is the side effect that we are most concerned with the most concerned with hypoglycemia so uh okay so let's look at uh, the different um uh, duration of action of drugs okay so let's write down um tolbutamide let's label it properly and say this is the drug and we are going to look at the duration of action and we we'll look at the daily dose range and uh, doses per day okay and the first drug that we are going to look at is tolbutamide and tolbutamide has got a duration of action of 6 to 10 hours okay so let's write it to your hours okay and the daily dose range is 1 to 3 grams and the number of doses per day is 2 to 3 let's look at this second drug chlorpropamide if we look at this drug it has got a duration of action of 24 to 72 hours okay so we've already mentioned uh, hours of that Okay, twelve, twenty-four to seventy-two, and the dose uh, range is hundred to five hundred milligrams, and the number of doses per day is one. Okay, why one? Because it's got a long duration of action. Chlorpropamide. Let's look at acetohexamide. Okay, so this has eight to twelve hours, and the dose is. Uh, 0.1 to 1.5 gram. This is more potent. Okay, and one to two doses are given daily. Uh, Tolazamide. Again, 12 to 18 hours. Okay, but the dose is 100 to 1,000 milligram. Okay, daily dose range. So. this is all milligram unless uh, mentioned okay so yeah and uh, tolazamide again 1 to 2 okay so these are all of uh, historical importance okay they are not currently very much used in the clinic so let's look at uh, glyburide and what's the other name glibenflamide um 
How much is that? It's 16 plus, and this is 2.5 to 20 milligram, and one to two dose are administered. What about um, 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 glipizide? Um, that is greater than six hours. Okay. 2.5 to 20 milligram again, one to two doses, okay? And what about uh, glyclozide? That again has 6 to 12 hours of uh, duration and the dose range 80 to 240 milligrams. And again, one to two doses are administered, okay? So now if we look at this data, what do we understand? The shortest acting drug among the second generation agent is glipizide. Okay, so because it has got a sh very short uh, duration of action, um, uh, the adverse effect profile would be less, so it causes least hypoglycemia of the uh, drugs that we have uh, discussed. Okay. Okay, we got to remember that uh, sulfonylureas. They do not interfere, they don't um, interfere uh, with the disease progression. Okay, so this means that um, the diabetic patient, they are, con they are going to continuously see a decline in their um, beta cell um, numbers okay. and the sulfonylureas they require uh, functioning beta cells so it's quite intuitive to understand that um, sulfonylureas on long-term use will lose their efficacy um, as the beta cells continue to decline um, therefore, the patients should uh, monitor, so patients should monitor their blood sugars and uh, reassessment should be done every six months, okay, so they need to visit the physician. Um, every six months okay, for um, assessment of their blood glucose as well as uh, um, system-wide um, assessment of their body. Okay. Um, so the caveat is that uh, short acting sulfonylureas um, may be safer than long acting drugs. Okay. Yeah, so that's the caveat that we need to keep in the back of our mind. Um, we should also remember that hypoglycemia may occur with the concurrent administration of drugs, um, like if the patient is consuming alcohol. Okay, so in alcoholics, we have to remember that this drug can cause disulfiram-like reaction. Okay, so when we take the patient history, and if the patient is a person consuming alcohol, so this, um, um, the disulfiram reaction should be explained. And alcohol also causes 
um, additive um, hypoglycemia when given with sulfonylureas and drugs like aspirin, okay, um, sulfonamide antibiotics and sometimes sulfonamides and trimethoprim is given. Okay, so this can all um, cause uh, hypoglycemia, so it's kind of a drug interaction. Um, so, uh, the effectiveness. Um, so, this drug should be administered uh, 30 minutes before meals okay, to derive the maximum benefit. So after uh, three to six months, what will happen is the blood sugar uh, sugar levels, they, when we say blood sugar, we mean the blood glucose level. Okay, so let's make it clear here. Blood glucose is what we mean. The blood glucose levels uh, would fall by fall by uh, 54 to 90 milligram per deciliter. Okay. And the HbA1c levels would fall by about uh, 20 percent. Okay, so uh, after three to six months, uh, we should be able to see a decline in the blood sugar level. And this should be intimated to the patient um, so that the patient, when they monitor their blood glucose, they are aware. Okay, they can see the efficacy of their, of the drug that they are um, uh, consuming. Okay? All right, so those are the most... Uh, important aspects of sulfonylureas.